Holocaust. From Holocaust survivors, liberators, and witnesses, we learn the truth, not fabrications or fake news about what really happened. Both of my parents were Holocaust survivors. I feel lucky to be here today because of what they had to go through in order to survive. So as the number of Holocaust survivors diminishes, it is important to hear their stories of survival, because soon we will have to hear their stories secondhand from their children and grandchildren or other relatives. We are very fortunate to have a Holocaust survivor, our guest speaker, Mrs. Edith Cord. Mrs. Cord will later talk about her life as a young girl on the run during the traumatic events of World War II and the German occupation of France. And now I would like to welcome back Rabbi Svi Shur, who will give us his personal thoughts on the importance of remembering the Holocaust. Thank you. As I light the memorial candle, please let's keep in mind the soul of the millions that died through hatred of the Holocaust, of these matches of life, that is. No, whoever has another one, it's not. This matchbook is wet. Good morning. This prayer was originally shared at the Yorktown Naval Weapons Station 2014 Holocaust Remembrance Servants by Rabbi David Katz. Rabbi Sholom, Master of the Universe, on this most solemn of occasions, we open our hearts, minds, and souls to you as we remember the six million, the 11 million, the indifference, and the evil. As we honor the heroes, the martyrs, the survivors, and the victims, we ask you to soothe our souls, to amplify our memories, to strengthen our resolve, and above all, to hear our prayers. We ask for your presence in our midst, for healing, light, and love to soothe and ease our pain as it commemorate the horrors that were committed not long ago. Please, O Holy One, be gentle with our souls. We ask that you help us to ever remember the stories we hear as, ta as tales of atrocities were shared as we re-encounter the unthinkable. We ask that these memories be strengthened and never fade in the hope that those who remember the mistakes of the past will not repeat them. Please, O Holy One, amplify our ability to remember. We ask that you strengthen our will, that you help us to ensure that the world does not again see such monstrosities. We're seeing them today in Syria. We see never again and we dedicate ourselves to this principle, to the idea that justice does not allow persecution, that genocide should not be repeated, and that vigilance is the responsibility of freedom at all costs. Please, O Holy One, make manifest ourself, our resolve that these horrors remain but terrible memories. We ask that you answer our prayers. We pray that the call of evil falls on deaf ears, that those who fight for freedom and justice always prevail, that those who need protection do not become victims. We pray that the lessons we learn from this darkest hour allow all humankind to better itself and to truly and nobly embody the idea that we each made in your image. We pray for the souls of the millions and millions of victims 
of this brutality. We pray that we honor their lives and their memories by observing this day and by doing everything in our power and beyond to make sure that no such shadow again darkens our world. Above all, we pray for peace, for shalom, for wholeness, to be in our midst now and forever. Please, O Holy One, answer our prayers and bring us a world devoid of hatred, devoid of atrocities, devoid of violence, devoid of murder, the void of hate, filled instead with peace and love. Cain, you hear its own. May this be God's will. And we all together, may we all say it together, Amen. Good morning again. I have the honor of introducing our guest speaker, Mrs. Edith Kord. Mrs. Kord was born in Vienna, Austria in 1928, the second child of observant Jewish parents. She moved to Italy, then to France with her family. Her father and older brother were arrested and later deported to Auschwitz. Edith and her mother remained in France. where Edith went into hiding and under an assumed French name and a false identity. Only Edith and her mother survived. Today we will hear Mrs. Cord's amazing story of survival as a young Jewish girl with a hidden identity during the traumatic events of the German occupation of France and religious persecution. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Edith Cord. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for all the work you do here at uh, Medicare, <laughs> because uh, as a senior, I'm one of the beneficiaries. <laughs> so I appreciate your, your work. It seems to work well. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I was spared the concentration camp experience. I don't know how well I would have coped with it as a young girl, because you know what they did. I found out what they did with young girls. Uh, the abomination that you just saw in this video, the abomination that was Nazi Germany, started with ideas. It didn't just happen. Most textbooks tell our kids that it started because of one guy, one bad guy, and because of the, the Germany lost the war and because of the Great Depression. But America had a Great Depression, and we didn't get death camps. We got the New Deal. We didn't get death camps. So allow me to go back a little bit to history to uh, talk where these ideas come from. How did it happen? Uh, we are the heirs. Uh, Western civilization, our civilization, is the heir of uh, uh, two traditions. One. Uh, secular, Greece and Rome, and one spiritual, the Judeo-Christian tradition. The Greeks gave us uh, the idea of self-government, which is tough, we know that, we just had a tough election. And uh, the Romans gave us the idea of Roman law, you live according to the rule of law. On the spiritual side, Judaism gave us a code of ethics, the Ten Commandments, don't lie, don't steal, don't go around murdering people, don't be jealous of what your neighbor has. And this, was, this uh, heritage was passed on to Christianity. Now, the sad thing was that uh, after the death of Jesus, it wasn't Jesus, it was after the death of Jesus, some of the church fathers, in order to separate uh, Christians from Jews, because initially the Christians were considered a Jewish sect, in order to separate Christianity from Judaism, they felt the need to really badmouth Jews. This, speak, this was done, as I say, after the death of Jesus, did not come from Jesus, and it was part of the teachings of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church dominated the medieval period, 
And uh, during the medieval period, Jews were discriminated against. When there was a plague, they were accused of uh, poisoning the wells. What did people know about bacteria and infectious diseases? They didn't know about that. So they blamed it on the Jews. Uh, during the Crusades, Jewish communities were often attacked and sometimes destroyed. And this continued throughout the medieval period. The medieval period was followed by the Renaissance. And the Renaissance, as you can see from my arrows, looked to, the, um, uh, to Greece and Rome for inspiration. It was a period of an opening of minds, the great explorations. America was discovered. There were scientific discoveries. And the Renaissance was followed by the period of the Enlightenment. Uh, you got my video here. Um, I'm sorry, my slide. Uh, in the 17th and in the 18th centuries. The Enlightenment, of which we are still the heirs, because the ideas of the Enlightenment are part of our constitution, the foundation of this country, uh, said that we are all equal. The uh, uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man in France, uh, the first sentence is, all men are born free and equal. And you remember what Jefferson said, we're all endowed with certain inalienable rights, you know that one. So the uh, Enlightenment still looked to Greece and Rome, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, for inspiration. What happened in German lands, in Prussia and in Russia? They took the wrong fork in the road. They veered in the direction. They wanted modernity, they wanted science, but they wanted control. And this became known as enlightened despotism. Uh, the tradition continues in Russia, as we know. The Enlightenment, uh, 17th and 18th century, were followed by, in the 19th century, by a period called Romanticism. And the Romantics looked for inspiration to the Middle Ages, not to Greece and Rome. So the Middle Ages, dominated by, by Catholicism, uh, uh, but the Romantic period, for the first time, uh, was interested in ordinary people. Remember your Shakespeare plays, it's all about kings and princes. Uh, some of you may have seen Les Mis, the, uh, based on the book by Victor Hugo, Les Miserables. Uh, this was, he, was a, um, he was a representative writer of the Romantic period. Uh, talks about ordinary people and their struggle in life. Again, Germany took the wrong fork in the road. Yes, they liked uh, ordinary people. Uh, they talked about peasants and you know, all, uh, plain folk. Uh, but they glorified ethnicity. And that gave us later on the Nazi slogan of blood and soil, Blut und Boden. Uh, so again, they took uh, German romanticism was also rapidly uh, nationalistic. It was Deutschland über alles, above everybody else. Rapidly anti-Semitic, the early 19th century, some of the German uh, romantic poets, very anti-Semitic. And anti-Semitism was a theme that ran throughout the 19th century. The latter part of the 19th century gave us racism. I don't think I need to belabor that. Some people are better than others. And uh, voila, and you have, and you have uh, the foundation of the Nazi ideology. I think I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> So you have an authoritarian tradition, remember? Uh, enlightened despotism. The Prussians also had a strong militarist tradition. Uh, romanticism, we talked about. Uh, they were, uh, when, uh, after Napoleon, after the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, uh, Germany was made up of 36 different political entities. Uh, and so one of the themes in the 19th century was the unification of all German-speaking lands a recurrent theme that gave Hitler the excuse later on for marching into Austria. It was just continuing the unification of all German-speaking countries. Uh, the, um, uh, Germany was not unified as a nation until 1871, almost a century after America became a, a country, as a unified country. Uh, so we had racism, we talked about that, and then you had colonization towards, of the lands to the east, which meant uh, what is now Poland, parts of Russia, and the Baltic states. That was one of the goals. So um, the, uh, the, the, the recent triggers were the military defeat in World War I, 
how could we Germans who are such good soldiers and we are so brave, how could we possibly have lost the war? It has to be somebody's fault. So there was a search for scapegoats, both the Jews and the others, what did we do? Nothing. We fought on the side of Germany. I have an uncle, uh, my mother's uh, younger brother, who fought for the Austrians and died uh, in 1916 in the battle in Italy, fighting for Austria. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The truth doesn't matter, you see. It's, uh, and then the depression was the, uh, and the massive inflation, these were the triggers. So here you have it, behind the, five, uh, behind the uh, enemies is the Jew. And we are in good company. On the left you've got the British flag, the American flag, and the Russians who fought against Germany in, 19, in, in World War I. Uh, when, uh, this is me, <laughs> as a little kid, I was born in Vienna, capital of Austria with my father on the left and my older brother. On the right, I am at the Pater, the great amusement park in Vienna, uh, with, uh, uh, this is a fake horse. <laughs> 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 it's paper mache. <laughs> my father took me there for my sixth birthday. I was very excited. So when I got married, I told my husband, I gotta, I gotta go horseback riding. He said, you wanna go horseback riding? He was born in New York City. He said, you wanna go horseback riding? I said, yeah, I gotta go horseback So we did. Um, uh, on the left, I am at the age of eight. My brother, on the right, when he got a, ca he got a camera for his bar mitzvah, and after that, we always had pictures. <laughs> so in the middle, I am with my mother. She was a big lady. Uh, I just had my, uh, uh, my genome, uh, you know, my DNA analyzed, and one of the results was that I'm, uh, I'm, I tend to be a little heavier than average. <laughs> Uh, I, get the, I got the genes, as you can see. Well, I grew up against the backdrop of a rising uh, Nazi Germany. So uh, Hitler came to power in 1933, and within days, he set the equivalent of the German Congress in, uh, on fire. So, and what does it say? I should use my pointer. Let me see, yeah. What does it say here? trample communism and shatter social democracy. It was, you know, he said so. So as a result of that, he became both the executive and the legislative uh, in, in Germany. And you, here you have a picture of the Reichstag in flames. This was right after he came to power. He came to power at the end of January 1933, so he didn't waste any time. Uh, in, uh, in this slide, I'm going too fast, okay. As soon as he came to power, he decided on a boycott against Jews, okay? And uh, he spells out here on this poster, uh, this is an announcement, and he spells out specific stores run by these specific people that should be boycotted. And here the slogan is, Germans defend yourself. So you've got these, these were, red, these were the brown shirts, you can tell by the uniforms. Standing in front of the stores, I dare you to cross and go shopping in this store. I dare you. To me, today, this is no different from the BDS movement, a boycott of Israel. It's the same thing in a new incarnation. I'm sad to say. So, uh, history repeats itself. The next thing Hitler did was the famous, the infamous book burnings. They went into schools, they went into libraries, they went into private homes, took out all the books and burnt them on a big square. Yeah, I was in Berlin a couple of years ago, and there's a big sign in one of the major squares of Berlin. That's where the big book burnings took place. Why? Because they don't want people to know. They want you to, they want you to have blinders on. They don't want you to know what's, in, what's written in the books. They only want you to know what they want you to know. These are the, uh, the infamous Nuremberg Laws passed in 1933 to find out how much blood, whose blood is where, and on that basis, people were persecuted. So I grew up aware of all this. We were very poor. My father had a business, and he lost the business. This, this was the Depression. So uh, I spent, the, I was very poor in Vienna. We, you know, barely had enough to eat. There were a lot of hand-me-downs, and... Uh, and my parents wa watched the rise of Nazism in Germany. There was agitation in Austria. The, uh, the, uh, the Austrian chancellor was assassinated. And I remember that. I was six years old. I was in first grade. 
and this was Dolphus, and the Nazis posted guards around his bed, forcing him to bleed to death. They wouldn't let a doctor come to his side to, uh, to treat his wounds. And I was six years old, I was horrified. How could you do such a thing? So I was well aware as a little girl of what was happening. So my parents decided it's time to leave. So in 1937, we moved to Italy. Well, I loved Italy. Uh, uh, this is the beautiful synagogue of Genoa on the left. And on, uh, on top is they have a school where my father signed me up for the day school. It was a modern school and I was, uh, the climate was mild, the, 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 time, the skies were blue, the houses were more pastels and, and I, I loved it, I loved the place. My father was making a living so it was very nice. Uh, this is a view of the city of Genoa, it's a major harbor in northern Italy. Well, I had one year of happiness. In, uh, <clears throat> in March 1938, the Nazis marched into Vienna and uh, we, we saw a flood of refugees coming to Genoa and I used to go down to the harbor to escort those who were lucky to uh, different parts of the world, those who had a place to go. <clears throat> in, in, in the summer of 1938, Hitler and Mussolini got together to form the Axis. And at that point, Mussolini passed the same racial laws that existed in Germany. So I remember the publication showing a, a noble woman, you know, a noble woman profile and then a caricature of a black man and a caricature of a Jew. We were all put together. And there were articles which even as a little girl, I was 10 years old, and, and, you know, we were supposed to be different in utero in our mother's wombs, you know, Jews were different. What did they know? It, it, the truth doesn't matter, you see, and you'll, we'll get to that. So in 1938, my father lost his job, my brother lost his job, my school was closed and I wasn't allowed to go to school with Italian children. And, and I remember going to school in the afternoon and not getting any homework. I was used to homework, you know, you study. Not getting any homework and, uh, and learning a lot about how great the fascists were. They taught about the fascio, you know, and unity there is strength, and, uh, but no homework, no schoolwork. So at the age of 10, I learned that when you want to keep people down, you keep them ignorant. I tell that to these kids when I talk in schools. Uh, so one way to keep people down, remember, is to keep them ignorant. So uh, my parents were called to the police and they had to, I understand this one works when it wants to, yeah. 19, uh, 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 Munich in October 1933, I'm sorry, 1938, uh, the two guys on the left, you have Chamberlain on the left next to Daladier, and the two guys on the right, you know, the two bad guys. France and England signed the Munich Agreement, uh, which allowed Hitler to keep Austria and allowed him to take the Sudeten from the, uh, the which is the, uh, uh, the mountainous part of uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. Because they didn't want war. The memories of World War I were fresh, the slaughter of a whole generation of young men was fresh and we didn't want war. And I was 10 years old and I remember there's going to be a war because Hitler will not stop. And of course I was right, I was 10. I was very much aware. A month later this was followed by Kristallnacht, the looting of Jewish businesses, smashing of windows, uh, burning of all the synagogues, all the synagogues burned to the ground and, uh, and attacks on, on Jews. It was an organized pogrom. The Italians called my father to the police. And why? Because they put in, uh, they, they put in a stamp here, Appartiene, Appartenenza alla razza ebraica. And here it's, it's in print, Denuncia di Appartenenza alla razza ebraica. We belong to the Hebrew race. I didn't know there was a Hebrew race. But you know, again, truth doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The truth doesn't matter. And so my father, this was the family list with my father and this was uh, for my mother. And the Italians said, get out. So I remember my father going to a whole bunch of consulates applying for uh, immigration. Nobody would let us in, starting with the United States. England took children in, the Kindertransport. America didn't even take children in. We weren't terrorists, we weren't drug dealers, but America slammed the door shut the first country. So my parents, in desperation, we entered France illegally. I don't have time to go into detail. There's so much to tell that I wrote a book. 
Uh, this one is the French, that was the, uh, the picture you saw. And then I, I translated the book and I published it in, in the France too. So this is the French edition. Uh, and I remember that day when we came to France. Um, we, uh, we took the train to the, uh, to the uh, border town from Ventimiglia to Menton, and there was no passport control that day. And then from Menton to Nice, we took a bus. And I remember that very clearly. I was 10 years old. I sat and we sat in the back of the bus, all four of us. There was nobody else in the bus. And the conductor came and my father, in broken French, asked for four tickets to Nice. And the conductor looks us over, one at a time. And I knew that he knew that we were illegal. And, I, and he didn't give us the tickets right away. And I remember wondering, is he going to call the police? Is he going to tell us to get off the bus? What's he going to do? And after a while, that seemed like an eternity. He sold us four tickets and he walked away. So that's how we got to France. In France, we applied for political asylum. This was April 1939, before the outbreak of World War II. And so France granted us political asylum. We were political refugees. Poverty, a constant companion. The clothes on my back were hand-me-downs and from charity. Uh, we were in the beautiful city of Nice. This is a picture I took on a return trip. Uh, Bay of Angels, you know, if you've been to Nice, it's very lovely. And we lived not too far from the Place Garibaldi, which looks different now. Um, this was my, I went to school. I'm back here. That's me. My first school. So I had just, by the way, I just learned Italian. I was fluent in Italian. Now I had to learn French. I didn't want to repeat. In Italy, they made me repeat third grade. And in France, I didn't want to repeat third grade. So I spent the summer studying French pretty much on my own. I was determined to learn French as fast as possible. So I did. And uh, here I am. Now, the laundry is some deserves explanation. This is with my mother. Um, we were not allowed to work in France. The only jobs open to foreigners were uh, mines, mining, and uh, uh, farm work. So uh, my, there was a small subsidy from a Jewish organization uh, funded by an American Jewish organization, the Joint Distribution Committee. And, um, uh, but it wasn't, uh, we used to joke, it's too much to die on, but it's not enough to live on. <laughs> so my parents supplemented that uh, little subsidy by doing laundry for the wealthy refugees. The wealthy refugees lived in hotels, couldn't do their laundry. There were no machines in those days. And so my parents would schlep the, the laundry, the dirty laundry from the hotels up the hill to where we lived. And my mother did the laundry and the washing and the ironing and the mending, and then we schlepped it back to town. And when I wasn't in school, I was helping her. So you got all that laundry in, in the back. Well, World War II breaks out. My father's arrested as an enemy alien. And uh, this is my dad uh, in peacetime, before the war. And this is my brother on the right at age 16 after we got to Nice. He looks pretty grim. Things were grim. We were both very much aware of what was going on. And this is the camp where the French put my father along with a bunch of other Jews. It's Le Camp des Milles. It's near Marseille. It used to be a brick factory. They put people, this is concrete. It was very dusty. They put a thin layer of straw on top. And there were um, several hundred people in the camp, I think 500, and three wash facilities, three. So I went to visit the place. There were graffiti on the wall, which I could still see. They put in the world capital of uh, vermin. That's where they put human beings. This was still Republican France. People are not aware of that. This was France before the Nazis occupied France. It's not a pretty picture in the French page, and the French have a lot of trouble with it, too, and with what follows. So he spent nine months there. When France fell, he came home. He was sick. Uh, he had an infection. He was hospitalized. And soon after that, let me go on to the next slide. France fell faster than anybody had anticipated. So here you have the great northern European plain. That's how Napoleon went to Moscow. Uh, and this is the border between France and Germany, okay, right over here. So the French had stationary guns facing Germany. Can you imagine that? Stationary couldn't be turned around. Well, the Germans knew that. They weren't going to get their kids shot. So what they did, they went, to, uh, they, they went to Holland and Belgium and headed straight for Paris. And within five weeks, France fell. In May 19, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, 
attack came in, uh, started in May by June, France fell, June 20th, France fell, and signed an armistice. The whole, the whole world was in shock. Nobody expected. Some of you may know that the, the, the British expedition was caught here in, in, in the Dunkirk, and they, they, sh they shipped them back to London. It was quite an adventure. Uh, after the, uh, the French signed an armistice, and uh, here is what Europe looked like. Okay, the, France was divided into two. The northern half was under direct German military control. The southern half was, uh, including the Atlantic coast, so you couldn't get out. And the southern half was so-called Free France with the capital line Vichy, because Paris was now in German military hands. And that's where we were. So we were down here in Nice. Les Milles was down here. The, country, the, the, the countries in, in uh, orange were uh, allies of Germany or puppet regimes. And the whole northern part, all the yellow stuff, is, uh, uh, was under German military control. So if you want to remember what your fathers or your grandfathers were up against in World War II, the Germans were also uh, controlling North Africa. In 1940, Britain stood alone. And I will never forget the, church, the speech by Winston Churchill when France fell. We will fight them on the beaches, we will fight them in the air, we will fight them in our cities, we will never surrender. He had a vision, he had a moral compass, and he knew evil when he saw it, and he wasn't going to yield. That's what it took, he was alone. And he fought alone for a year and a half. America didn't enter World War II until a year and a half later after Pearl Harbor. Churchill and England stood alone against all this. Well, after France fell, my father was released briefly, and within days, there was that knock on the door at the crack of dawn. We were all in bed. Two French policemen came to the door, and they said to my father and to my brother, who had just turned 17, you have 30 minutes to get dressed, pack your bags, and say goodbye to your family. And that's the last time I saw my father. They were both sent to the infamous camp of Gurs, and from there they were both in several other camps. My father, my, I don't have time to go into detail, my brother at one point was working in a quarry, that's my brother on the left. And, uh, uh, and I was kicked out, my mother and I, we were kicked out of Nice. Nice was too nice, it was forbidden to Jews, so we were able to get a residence permit in a village in the south of France, southwestern France. And this is when I, what I looked like when I arrived in the village, I still looked like a schoolgirl. No more school for me, I'm, now, I'm 13 in that picture. No more school, uh, because the French didn't have the busing system we had. Uh, so if you had finished your grade school education, your minimal schooling, which is, was eight years at the time, then you had to go to a, uh, be a, door, a, um, a boarder in a uh, public school in a nearby town. So there was no more schooling for me in the village. Of course, we couldn't afford to send me away. So here I am on the right, look like a peasant. Outgrowing my clothes, I'm 14 in that picture. And uh, this is my brother's last picture before he was deported. This is a picture of all the concentration camps in France. All those Stars of David are concentration camps. So my brother and my father were sent to Gurs. My father ended up in Rivesart. My brother was in Agde and in Bram. And eventually they were sent to uh, a camp outside of Paris called Drancy, where they were processed. Name, birth date, birthplace, nationality. And from there, they were, they were packed in sealed cattle cars and after three days and three nights without food, water, or sanitation, they arrived in Auschwitz. And based on uh, a, hand, a, a, a smidgen that survived, that experienced that, that survived, um, within a couple of hours, everybody was in the train, was walking around, and if you would pardon my French, in shit. There were typically 1,000 people per convoy, and on average, between two and 10 survived. So this is arrival in Auschwitz. The men to one side, the women on the other side, and you've got well-fed, well-dressed German soldiers. I would have liked it if I stood like that in front of you. Is that arrogant or what? And I decide who shall live and who shall die. There was a doctor 
Dr. Mengele. I don't know what he did with the Hippocratic Oath, which said, never first do no harm. And he decided who shall live and who shall die. Those who look too old, too young, too sick, too weak, straight to the gas chamber. And the others were literally worked to death because the Germans had no interest in keeping us alive. They used us as slave labor, but with no, no, no inadequate food and, 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 and unbelievably bad conditions because they didn't want to keep us alive. They worked us to death, literally. So, for those who say it didn't happen, they kept records. So I brought along the book, this is just France. These uh, pages are taken from this book, the Memorial de la Deportation des Juifs de France. I found the list with my brother's name on top, um, no, my father's name on top, and my brother's name on this list, Kurt. About almost 80,000 Jews were deported from France. As I say, per convoy, between two and 10 survived. My family was not among them. Meanwhile, things were getting very hot, and my, uh, I, I ended up going into hiding with the help of a Jewish underground organization, uh, the, the Jewish Scouts of France, uh, who had a clandestine branch to the CCM, the sixth. And what they did was uh, uh, try to save the kids. So this is my fake birth certificate. Supposedly, I was the daughter of, you know, two very French-sounding names, a uh, Roman Catholic, non-practicing, which was not uncommon in France at the time. Uh, st still not common, uh, still common. And then uh, here I am, my first hiding place, uh, I'm over here. My first hiding place was a school run by the nuns. It was a Catholic high school for girls run by nuns. And um, of course, I didn't know anything about Catholicism, so the first Sunday I gave myself away, almost gave myself away, and I tried so hard to fit in. Uh, and, um, but I did some, you know, broke one of the rules. I had communion after eating breakfast, which at the time was forbidden. Now, now people can eat breakfast before communion, but at the time, they, I, go, I come back to the, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the school, and the whole school is in an uproar. I've committed a mortal sin. I what? And I thought, how could I have committed? Well, you ate breakfast before communion. And I thought to myself with my 15-year-old my logic, uh, there are some awful things going on out there, and this is a mortal sin? <laughs> but couldn't say anything. So, so uh, the, the picture on the right shows me during the uh, Christmas vacation, the uh, Jewish underground organized a scout camp for all the kids in hiding. So this is the girls, group of the girls. Uh, and because um, uh, we, we couldn't go home. You know, the schools were closed of a Christmas vacation, so we couldn't go home. So they had a scout camp and we pretended to be Protestant. Uh, Protestants were a small minority. Here I am in hiding. Uh, and this is in hiding in another school. I kept moving all the time because uh, I forgot to mention that this picture, the kids took it home over the summer, and uh, somebody from my village recognized me and said, oh, that's not her real name, I know who she is. Da, 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 da. So the nuns found out and I was gone the next day. Wow. Yeah. So it wasn't that somebody deliberately gave me away, I want to emphasize that, the kids were nice. Um, it just happened, somebody recognized me. So then uh, I moved to a, uh, to a home which was run by the six and, uh, and um, came down with diphtheria, I was hospitalized. While I was getting better in the hospital, I came down with scarlet fever, so the doctor said this child is run down, and at that point I hit the bottom, I hit bottom. Uh, because for me, the persecution had been going on for five years. From the age of 10, I was now 15. I was physically diminished, I was very sick. I'm so glad we have vaccines for diphtheria and that we have penicillin for scarlet fever, because they're awful illnesses. And I was ready to give up, and I wrote a letter to my mother saying, we're all going to die sooner or later. This was 1943, uh, remember? The war had been going on for, for, for me, the persecution for five years, the war for four. <coughs> Couldn't take it anymore. And I thought, well, eventually we'll all die. I wasn't too far wrong. <coughs> mm. 
Well, I didn't die. Uh, the, uh, the underground did what they could to help my morale. But uh, I ended up moving. I was almost always on the move. I moved 13 times in the space of one year. I was always on the move. And then one day I get picked up in another school, and I thought, well, you know, well, I'm just going to another school, right? I get, uh, <laughs> that's the way it is. You learn not to ask questions, because the less you know, the better off you are. So they said, no, tomorrow we're going to try and smuggle you into Switzerland. So the Swiss took children up to the age of 16, boys and girls, and uh, uh, so we were a group of 30 teenagers, and we had a five-year-old with us. And uh, we, uh, we took the train to a nearby border town. We only we told, you know, wear double layers of clothing because so you have something to wear once you get to Switzerland and carry on, take only what you can carry. So we left our stuff behind. Of course, we all took pictures of our families. And uh, we trekked all day. Uh, first, we got, uh, we missed the train station. Then uh, we, so we had to walk back. Then uh, we uh, got lost in the woods. We had two Spanish tour guides uh, who didn't know the way. They were supposed to, they didn't. So we went around in circles, and then there were patrols, and we had to carry the five-year-old, and then we went through the woods, and the kid was crying because of the branch. It was an incredible story, and it was the first story I wrote down because it was so dramatic. Well, when we got to Switzerland at the end of the day with renewed energy, we were young, uh, I wrote a poem right away, freedom. No more hiding, no more lying, we're free. And some of us kissed the ground. We exchanged real names because we've been, we were forced to lie. Don't tell your real name to anybody. And I spent, and when I got to Switzerland, they discovered that I was sick. So here I am with a hand-me-down. I'm wearing the same clothes, by the way, you may not have noticed. But the blouse was made of a dress I had outgrown, and the skirt was uh, made from pants from my brother, the bottom of the pants. And I wear the same thing for several years in a row. The jacket, of course, was too small. It was, it was a charity. And so here I am, my Swiss ID on the right, and the bottom is a uh, sanatorium. I was sent to a sanatorium because I had an active case of TB. In Switzerland, still no schooling. I went to work as a nanny. This is the kid I took care of. And she was the daughter of the, uh, the directors of a home for Jewish kids. These were all refugee boys whose parents were killed. And, uh, uh, and I was now 16, and I was worried that I had no skills, and I was still hoping my father would uh, survive. And if he did, I, he would be sick, and I have to go to work, and I had no skills. So I was worried about that. So I, uh, I can't go into detail, but I taught myself how to type. My boss was not very nice. So I told her, I need to learn how to type. She said, you want to type? Here's a book, here's a type, but a good type. And after, this was after putting in 10 and 12 hour a day taking care of the kid, because I was up with her and I didn't stop until she was in bed. And uh, when she was snapping, I would do her laundry by hand, her diapers. And I also learned English. I started to learn English pretty much on my own. I studied for two hours every night and finished a book in three months, and I had my basic irregular verbs under my belt, and you know, I know not to say he should have went. <laughs> and I know when it's ITS with an apostrophe or without. <laughs> so uh, this would come in handy later on. Uh, well, I survived, and my mother survived. So here we are extreme poverty. We had absolutely nothing. I had no country, I had no home, I had no money, I had no support, I had no education. I had nothing. I started life minus with minus zero, if there is such a thing. Uh, we lived in this slum house on the left, uh, which was made up of uh, four tiny apartments. Each apartment had two tiny rooms, two in the front and two in the back. This was on a return visit. And there was no running water. There was an outhouse, which was a hole in the ground paved, and you had to do your thing, you know. And the neighbors used to miss. So these are clothes from America, from a relative. So all the clothes I'm wearing from the next few pictures is either from relatives in the United States or from charity. We didn't have a dime. This is a water fountain where I had to go and get the water, and I did laundry by hand, you know, the sheets, towels, everything. And we had to make a living. 
there was no money. We had to work. And I had to get an education. And I, the thing I think that saved my sanity is that I wanted an education more than anything else. So I, uh, I was offered a scholarship if I would catch up six years in one. That's the French baccalaureate, which meant all of middle school, all of high school, the French baccalaureate, which means you had to learn algebra, geometry, uh, uh, and apply your algebra to geometric problems. You had to know French literature, uh, the history of ideas. You had to know how to write a, re a literary research paper. And I had one school year to do all that. And I said, I missed so much school. Please, I need more time. And she said, that's all the money I got. So take it or leave it. So I took it. And I didn't do anything that year but study, 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 study. Didn't go out on a date, didn't go to movies, didn't go out to play, no sports, nothing. Study. 12 hours and longer every day. I was determined. I got my baccalaureate, and after that, after the baccalaureate, we had no money. My mother often lo lost her job. She had no skills. You know, she was a lady born in 1903 from a middle class family. She, learned, she was taught how to cook and how to embroider and play the piano. And so the only skill she has was sewing. So she used to uh, work in sweatshops, and she frequently lost her job. So that last year, we were starving. And, uh, and I took this job on the foire, on the markets, which was considered highly undignified for a young lady. Uh, nice girls don't do that. Well, you know, I had no choice. You either starve or you do this. The friend still has this class thing. My boss was Jewish. He was a, uh, he was a trained uh, engineer in ag agronomy. And like the rest of us, he had to pick up uh, the pieces. He had a wife and a son, and so that's what he did. It was an easy way to, it didn't require much capital to have merchandise and a, and a, and a van, and then you went to different cities every day and opened up your, your tent and did some business. And so I did that uh, three summers in a row. So uh, after I got my baccalaureate, I went to the University of Toulouse, I got my master's degree, and then I came to the United States. I applied for immigration to the United States, since this is a hot topic these days. I applied for immigration to the United States again, my mother did, in 1945 when the war was over. America still wouldn't let me in. I had to wait out, I, uh, I had to wait out my quota. And the quota at that time was at least five years. So uh, I couldn't sit around and twiddle my thumbs, you know. I mean, I had lost all that time during the war running for my life, and I had to get some schooling. So I uh, went to school and I got an education, so I have a French education. I'm still fluent in French, and I speak like a native, which saved me during the war because I could pass for French. When I went into hiding, my fluency and native fluency in French saved my life, or contributed to save my life. So, um, uh, and b when, I, when I got the papers from the, the letter from the American consulate saying, your time is up, you need to get your documents ready, it took a whole year for the American consulate to vet me. Had I ever been a communist? Had I ever been a Nazi? Had I ever been arrested? Did I have any mental problems? Had I ever been to a shrink? I had to go to a doctor approved by the American consulate and strip naked to show that I had no blemishes, no physical blemishes. I mean, and it took, and they went back to the village where I had worked during the war. The people in the village, we kept in touch with them. They told us, oh, there was somebody from the American consulate who came and asked questions about you. So boy, was I vetted. <laughs> <laughs> so the, coming to America was a reference. So uh, this is what I looked like. Uh, I was so tired of not having any clothes that I made that dress. It's a very simple dress, but you know, it looks OK. <laughs> and uh, my mother used to knit my clothes for me. She used to always knit sweaters. So I always had knitted sweaters, and this is my dress. And that's what I looked like when I came to America. After I graduated from the university and life looked up. So here I am as a university professor. <laughs> I, I taught for 14 years, and this is it, done at, at an art workshop. I'm not, I don't know how to draw, I'm not an artist, but it sort of uh, symbolizes a little bit my story, because over here are uh, the, the chains, and, and stormy weather, and lightning, and, and I'm gradually the chains are broken, and I'm gradually climb out of the hole. It's a slow process until I finally reach sunshine and flowers, and back to life. For those who say it didn't happen, the Germans kept records. This is Bart Arlson. These records have now been digitized, most of them at the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington. And the question I wrestled with is, how did they do it? How did
wanted to do it. I mean, I like German culture. You know, I grew up, my early years, were, I was in a German environment. I love Goethe, I love Schiller, I love Beethoven, I love Bach, Bach and Brahms and Mozart, and, and, and yet, and yet. How does it go together? How did they do it? So here are the methods. The massive propaganda and lies, censorship and mind control, indoctrination of the young, manipulation through favors, threats, violence, and, that, and here are some pictures. This is Goebbels, the minister of propaganda, who said, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie, uh, the lie can be maintained only if you shield the people from the political, economic, and military consequences of the lie. And so it's important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent, for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. And by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. To tell you what kind of a man Goebbels was, he was a doctor, I don't know in what, but he had a doctorate. He was married, he had five children. When Germany was defeated, he killed his five children, killed his wife and killed himself. That's the kind of guy he was. Fanatic. So, massive propaganda, uh, those, this was before television, every German had to have a radio, mandatory. Why? So they could hear Hitler's speeches. And Hitler had trained himself when he was uh, uh, rising uh, to power in the 20s to, to give talks that were mesmerizing, you know, to, and you know, in German, the verb goes at the end. So you sort of wait to hear the end of the sentence in order to find out what this is all about. So he had trained himself and that was, everybody had to listen to his speeches. Uh, so it was mandatory for every German to have. This is an, an example of the lie. Uh, 1943, America was already fighting Germany. Germany was fighting a war on two sides. And he kept telling the German people that uh, without stopping forward to final victory. This is the motto in 1943. And notice the villains, this is the communists, the Americans, the British, and of course, the Jews. Of course, when we were in concentration camps, it doesn't matter, the truth doesn't matter, you see. The truth doesn't matter. Uh, if you listen to a foreign radio station like the BBC, which was a lifeline in those days, you were a traitor and you were sent to prison or to a concentration camp. Uh, manipulation of the young, you had the personality cult, of course, and then all 10-year-olds into the Hitler Youth. And some of the 10-year-old boys were sent, taken away from their families and sent to these special schools where they could train them to become SS men. And they think girls were not exempt. I love this picture because she's kind of cute. She's about, what, nine, 10 years old. And it says, you two belong to the Fuhrer. Imagine a, a president, any president, I don't care which party, telling your kids that they belong to the president. I mean, you would tell them to go take a hike. I mean, in our context, it's unthinkable. But they accepted it. Propaganda, mind control. And this is a scene from uh, the Schindler's List. Remember, uh, the uh, Jewish family is kicked out and Schindler gets the uh, beautiful apartment. So distribution through favors. Businesses that were taken away from Jews were given to the party cronies. Uh, so when bribes didn't work, there were threats, followed by beatings. They used to wait in the, in the 30s, they would wait for people around the corner and beat them up. Uh, and uh, arrests, indiscriminate terror, because you never knew when you would get that knock on the door, and finally murder. And if you think that only Jews were persecuted, anybody who opposed the regime, and on the left is Father Maximilian Kolbe, a Catholic priest who was murdered in Auschwitz. I think the church has since canonized him. And on the right is Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Protestant minister who was in prison. He wrote letters from prison, which some of you may be familiar with. And they kept him alive until the allies were within days of, of his prison. And then they decided to shoot him. They wouldn't let him live. So I end with lessons from my life because if we don't learn, we are repeating the same stuff. So the, uh, the first lesson is what you think matters because it all starts with ideas. Ideas have consequences. Are they life enhancing or life destroying? I won't go through all 10 lessons because we don't have time, but hatred, I do not hate. Hatred is an attachment. Hatred is a destructive emotion and it ties you, if you hate somebody, you pay attention to that person. There are some people so busy, they're so busy hating their neighbors that they don't take care of the welfare of their own people. They shall remain unnamed, because I don't want to be political, but you can fill in the gaps. 
So to me, uh, France, after World War II, the French hated the Germans. And they were, there was so much hatred, you could cut it with a knife. And it took me a while, it took, partly through schooling and my studies, that I realized that hatred is like a ping pong ball. You can, I hate you, you hate me back. And I mean, think of the Capulets and the Montagues, the two families, uh, aristocratic families, they hate each other. So they don't come together until the sacrifice of their children, Romeo and Juliet. They have to die because the Capulets and the Montagues can't get along and they hate each other. Hatreds. Lots of, there are lots of Romeo and Juliets around in this world. Uh, and uh, a lot of this is, is uh, I, I like to fo focus on, on lesson five. Our shared values have allowed us to build a strong and diverse country with opportunities for all. Let us emphasize our common humanity and not our differences. And we do have to have shared values if we want to live together in peace. Uh, but number eight, knowledge is not enough because knowledge as much as I love knowledge, and I'm, a, I'm an eternal scholar, student, knowledge can be used for good, it can be used for evil. The people who made the poison gas for the gas chambers, they were chemists, they were PhDs in chemistry. The doctor who decided who shall live and who shall die, he was a doctor, he experimented on children. He was a physician, so knowledge is not enough. You have to have a moral compass to use it for the good. Because knowledge without a moral compass is dangerous. Just think of North Korea. Uh, and finally, I, I'd like to leave you with the thought from Pierre Curie. Il faut faire de sa vie un rêve, et de ce rêve une réalité. We must make of our life a dream, and turn that dream into reality. But first comes the vision. Thank you very much. I don't know the format. If you want to talk to me, I'll, be, I'll stick around. And I have some cards if you want a uh, uh, little more information. This is uh, the picture of the book, and on the back there's some information. So if you, I'll be happy to stick around and talk to you later. Thank you. Please remain standing for those that are able to. I'm saying, Menucha Nuchono, I'll come for Ashkino. Bemalos Kidoshi Mutorim, Kizara Haraki, your Masibim, Esnishmos Hakadoshim, Vatahorim, Shemsu, Vishner Gu, Vishnish Nahatu, Vishnanif Sufu, Vishnit Bu, Vishnach Nuku. Akidush Hashem Began Eden Tem Nuchosom Lochein Balar Rachamim Yasti Bame Say Second of Ob Leonamim Vitzor Vitzor Achaim Esnish Mosehem Adenoyach Mosom Yonuch Bisholom Amish Mosehem Benemar Amen O God full of mercy who dwells in high Grant proper rest on the wings of the divine presence and the lofty levels of the holy and the pure, who shine like the glow of the firmament for the souls of all those, the holy ones and pure ones who were killed, murdered, slaughtered, burned, drowned, and, sangle, and strangled all for the sanctification of your name. May their resting place be in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, may the Master of Mercy shelter them in the shelter of his wings for eternity. And may, his bind their, may he bind their souls in the bond of life, though mighty is their heritage. And may they repose in peace on their resting places. Let us all respond. Amen.
I would like to thank from the Office of Communications, Division of Design Services, Mr. Luke Borland for uh, designing the program and poster for this event. I would also like to thank the members of the CMS Holocaust Memorial Program Planning Committee and the Office of Equal Opportunity and Civil Rights for making this program possible. This concludes our program. Thank you for attending and listening.